All right, so welcome to the theoretical and computation mobile physics seminar. So today I'm uh, honored to host Dr. Diego Gomez, who is visiting us from Auburn University. So by way of introduction, uh, Diego was trained initially in biological sciences back home in Brazil in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro where he also obtained actually a, a master's of science degree in biophysics, moving more and more from biology to physics, and also a PhD from, oh, same university in Brazil, right, in biophysics, where he actually started using molecular models to run of phosphorus hydrolase in nanotechnology and nanostructures. Then after that, he had quite a few back and forth between Brazil and France. So initially he moved to France as a postdoctor fellow for, for one year, back to Brazil as a principal investigator working in Brazil for almost a year, a few years actually, before they went back to Strasbourg in France because of some family reasons, then working there for quite a few years. And again, back to Brazil and now Actually, uh, Diego is a research scientist, senior research scientist at the physics department of Auburn University, where he works with our former colleague, Rafael Bernari. Yeah, so he, Diego actually has um, a lot of interest. So he is interested, obviously, in biophysics and molecular simulation. But at the same time, he is also quite knowledgeable in um, handling pro, uh, Hardware, like he's a manager of the DJ2 machine in Raphael's group, and also developing the code, working, for example, on AlphaFold plugin for DMD that many of you know. So, in case you are interested in AlphaFold and you want to interact a little bit more with Diego and see what he has been doing there and how to improve it and how to do it better, so take, take advantage of the time that we have with him here. So, Today, he's going to actually talk about some molecular simulation of the mechanical systems that they have been studying. And then uh, what I know from Rafael is that you guys have been repeating these simulations hundreds of times and how to collect all the information, analyze them, and I'm not going to preempt your talk. Please, okay. thank you very much for coming all the way. Thank you for the Amount of food, <laughs> guys, especially uh, it's really nice. So before I bug you with this story, I will just show uh, some slides of things I've done in the past. I'll be quick, and you can ask some other questions uh, later. So as I said, oh. I I've See been doing that. this for a while <laughs> in multiple places. So one thing that you didn't miss. So, so during my PhD, I spent a year and a half here at the Pacific Northwest National Lab because of the project. So we were working with organic phosphate, and it's kind of restricted to work with that. Mm -hmm. so it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. Different to good. And you see, I'm old. I used to work with those <laughs> kind of computers. Mm -hmm. IBM, very old. Yeah. And I'll show a picture of me later. Uh, so, I'm just joining your group. So 50% of my salary is being paid by Imad. And one of the things that I'm going to do is the cyber shuttle molecular dynamics like dispatcher with the HPC cloud or HPC supercomputers. But what you don't know is that I worked on the very first in the world ever MD simulation portal. Yeah, that was a project funded by HP like years, five years ago. That got be funded because we didn't like it anymore. Anyway, that was actually my first paper. I, was in. Uh, I worked a lot with Rafael back in Brazil with uh, anesthetics and membranes. You see, we published a lot together uh, in the past, and now we're back publishing again. So we did a lot of studies with uh, local anesthetics and the uh, free energy profile on the membranes, understanding how they, how they work. So also, so during the PhD, wait, let's put this. No, this one is that's better. So I worked with developing confinement models for enzymes in nanopores. And during that work, 
my hero was David Fontaine because he helped me a lot. Maybe you don't remember this, but I, I wouldn't get my PhD if it wasn't for him. So I'm very thankful for David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's continue this. So after that PhD, I went to France for the first time. Yeah, I don't think I'm good in business. Hey. So I went to France for the first time to work with uh, the Hayat to develop models for protein protein docking. And there we developed a genetic algorithm to sample structures that were generated by normal modes and to the docking, it failed catastrophically. So I'll keep continuing. So from that, I went to Brazil and I created a group in the National Institute of Standards. I was lucky to get the funding. And we did a lot of work on biofuels and mostly in molecular dynamics and versions of uh, cellulose membranes. I mean, there was a lot of money at that time to, to work on that. But I won't bug much of you. We also developed some workflows in there. Uh, one of the biggest ones was called Azaprof, it was an automatic pipeline to collect data, create comparative modeling models for proteins, and do structural annotation. Yeah, there was a, a very nice one. Protocols for filter screening, this uh, mm -hmm. uh, good things. So fast forward to two years ago. So I went to Auburn and started to join the PMD community doing some plugin development. And one of the first tasks was to fix some of the stuff in QMD or develop some uh, new plugins. I'll get into that right now. And so my first uh, assignment actually was something of the, the, the time. So alcohol was coming out. Everyone was like baffled by it. And everyone tried to create models using alcohol. And that's, that's actually not trivial. And then came this tool, this call up code that everyone was using, but it fails all the time. It, you get disconnections, it doesn't handle your whole protein. So we needed to make a like a, a way so you can run Apple code locally without issues. So what we did is like a small EMD plugin, which has themes because it uses the new TK uh, console. It does use part Python most of the time. So this is very typical, typical TK that calls the Python routine uh, elsewhere. Uh, the big issue here, I'm not going to black a lot about this, is that Alpha keeps changing their API, yeah. which is awful. Now I understand why John doesn't like Python, mm -hmm. because they keep changing and then you have to rewrite the problem all the time. It's, it's awful. But anyway, uh, we'll release a new update. And hopefully it will come with the new BMD and it will work uh, flawlessly. So it has some features that are make the, the user use Apple in a straightforward way. So you call it quick fold. <clears throat> it is, point yeah, eight. Quick fold. <laughs> yeah, What's the latest version of the of quick fold? 0 0.9. 0 0.9. Yeah, so okay. I have to update the, the, the figure. So <clears throat> It must go to 1.0, right? And you can do multiple protein domains. Yes. Is that right? So, it is, so it started with monomer, then they released the multimer, right. and then they changed the way. Anyway, I see. You can put one sequence or multiple sequences. You can load the fastest sequence, and it will do all the models for you mm -hmm. at once. But it, uh, it can minimize the GPU. You can resume uh, using pre-computed multiple sequence alignments. Right. So the, the basic functionality, so you don't have to write the, the command line and interpret. And you run it locally, right? You, you download run, you run, everything. Correct. Yeah. You run locally. Okay. Uh, as a future perspective, we want to just include a like a button, mm -hmm. so it submits your job to your scheduler. Like so, mm -hmm. so if your local machine has is a submission node, okay. you can just go to the cluster and. You're done. I see. Um, if you're running on a cluster and you are able to open the PMD interface without even BMD, you might be able to do it. I see. Okay. Yeah. You have to open the conda to run it. Uh, I also put some buttons so you can access the predictions and metrics of Apple real quick. And well, that's useful. 
but they also changed some stuff in there. But we have to update, we have to keep updating Python stuff. Yeah, then it maps to the interface. Right. So, so this whole thing loads into the MD Yeah, right? you, you open the MD, uh, extensions, modeling, and quick both. But the results coming back from alcohol comes yeah, into the MD. Yeah, window. you open the MD. Yes, you okay. Press the button. Although all the graphs are in Python. So once you, you install the quick fold, you will install a Conda environment for sure. Python for alcohol. So if you follow the instructions, you'll be able to plot all the graphs flawlessly. Well, I mean, my main question was about the molecule itself, the model. Oh, yeah. so if you press the uh, load results or on models, it will load into the MD. So this, this is Pico. OK. Yeah, only alpha code is Python. Is the uh, sequence database also locally or uh, only local? Yeah, right now it's only local. Okay. The, the faster file. Unless it's mounted on your network. I mean, uh, when you are generating the MSA, is it like send a query somewhere else? It's all local. It's all local. local. Yeah. Okay. So that means there will be a large uh, local file. Oh, yeah. We need mm -hmm. more, more support terabytes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. The advantage is that you run everything local. So you don't have issues with your PI. Mm -hmm. Intellectual property in yeah. and related to that first is also uh, and then related to this question. So like Uniprot and source related program and all that. Once you do it, you know, you load the you, you save a local copy, do you have like a prompt for people to update it or later say, you know, like once and I don't know if the databases are basically getting updated themselves. That's interesting sense so we're not getting structures from alcohol database. Right. You are running alcohol. Right. But then if you do it in a say, right? So you do not pull sequence alignment. Oh, okay, okay. Right? You can just rerun. What I mean is that, uh, ah, so the Uniprot, I see the grid line, right? For example, on the wall left corner. Yeah. So it's Uniprot, right? So it is actually a sequence database, right? Exactly right. right. I'm not following your question. So the Uniprot is a sequence database. Right. right. But we are not accessing the Uniprot right now. You're just copying and pasting the sequence. In, in in the field, right, right. But then it's you 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 posted your sequence, right? Fast. No, you're not posting. You're running local. Right, right. What I mean is, you okay? You have a program, local, right? You have a sequence. Now you're running it against the MSA against a so if you need right? You you doing the multiple sequence alignment against. The, okay, so if Uniprot updates, right. What you need to do is just download Uniprot again. And that's what I meant. So yes, what I meant, yes, exactly. That, that you are sure no, about, there's right? no tool. When you install uh, Alphafold, you download the latest version of Uniprod. Of Uniprod. Yeah. Okay. That is compiled by then, like oh. every few months. Yeah. So if you want just to rerun, you just open the interface and rerun. Right. Just, just make sure you don't use the pre computed MSA. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, any other questions on, on that? So how does it work with the current VMD? Back to this question. So the current VMD that comes with your tool, how does it handle the databases? Do you download them when when you install you them? No, you install it. Do you have so to you do have it yourself? To, so you have to have a alpha port installation in your okay. machine. Oh, alpha port. You have yeah. to install alpha port. It. it has its own Conda environment. Mm -hmm. And during the installation I process, see, it downloads all the databases. So what we have here is, is a is an interface to run it. Gotcha. Once it's installed, I see. I see. You can close that message. Okay. Somebody has enabled captioning. I don't know who, but you can close it on your computer. Can I close it? Yeah, yeah, it's yes. you. It won't. No, it's on your computer. It. We have to like escape out of the screen sharing to do that. Oh no, maybe I'm here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so yeah. I just right now. Cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, enough with that. So if we have time later, I'll talk about my, my favorite baby, which I didn't show uh, in my, my history. Yeah, so QuickFold does also has a version for Omega Fold, which is developed here in this university. So it's in GitHub. Uh, the interface is actually Omega Fold is much easier to install than QuickFold. 
just download the binary, you compile the database once, and you're good. And mm -hmm. it runs super fast and does uh, pretty decent predictions based on the uh, paper. Okay, I'm done with this like brief introduction, uh, things I did in the past. And this is just because maybe John is watching. I have figures made with my mouth rendered. So do not be offended. <laughs> You're really yes. into movies. I can okay. tell. <laughs> okay. And I have Romex and Amber. Mm -hmm. I use, so since I'm old, I work in too many places. I've worked with Romex, Gromos, Char, Amber. I, I love Amber. I, I do love Romex. I Sorry. don't know why we invited you. Yeah. <laughs> but now uh, I have a new passion, which is the vegan. Sure. <laughs> okay. So I'll give my blood to that. Mm -hmm. to work. Okay, back to this. So uh, the thing I want to talk today is a ongoing project that is not finished, not published. So I have to I had to hide some of the mm -hmm. identifiers of the results that we have, mm -hmm. or else people who Keep my ass. So anyway, so I want to talk about uh, the small project that we are simulating a human protein with a prospective inhibitor, which is a alpha body. And I'll talk about this guy. So alpha bodies are super small molecules that are super simple and very stable. And they were discovered by, like 20 something years ago. And at the time, the promise that was that antibodies, they are like super small molecules that you can engineer, fine tune, and mature their, their affinity to bind to different targets. Mm. And the promise at the time is that antibodies may one day replace antibodies and mm. be more specific, uh, easier to produce, and like more effective, and easier to produce in scale and have many applications. So it's a small class of molecules. So antibodies, nanobodies, and this one, antibodies are the ones with three helixes. And since they have this only three helixes, so the helix has the, the helix term. So you have like just a few uh, amino acids that you can modify and optimize. And people have been doing this in many, many applications. Mm -hmm. So the goals are to like block proteins that are involved in cancer, use it for detection for specific proteins. So many biotechnological medical applications that are available for FE bodies. Okay, and then you can attach like multiple some once once you get a model that is target specific, you can add like warheads or Probes. So it's used a lot for imaging and mm -hmm. very specific detail of some interaction. Uh, as I was showing, so normally what, what is done with this molecule is that you select like a few regions of exposed, like binding sites, binding region exposed to residues, and you run a, a screening. So you can, there are assays that you can run this in two, one, two days. And mature the affinity really quick to your targets. So this is one example of the, this is showcase uh, the things that you can do with that. So on, on our side, so it is, uh, we have a collaboration with uh, Mike Monash in, uh, in Switzerland. And what they, what they made is that they optimized one antibody to a, a human protein that is the PDL1. Actually, PD1, which is a protein that acts in the like checkpoints of cell like repair, but uh, cancer T. So the idea is that if you create a protein that can come here and uh, alter this mechanism, so block interaction in, in this checkpoint, you want the checkpoint of PD01 and give it so you can modulate. How the T cell, uh, T cell, T, yeah, T cell, the killer cell will will or will not kill the cell, and then you can help you modulate the like, cleaning of cancer activities. So, think about it, 
and um, you can use it to to modulate uh, activity of cancer. That's the idea. But to to, to our uh, project, what was important was to use it as a detector. Okay, let's go back to the to the point. So to use it, a molecule as a detector, like a bio sensor, we must first absorb it or attach it to the surface. In this case, attaching was the was the case. So the issue that we that we had that when attaching the so we have the PDO one, so we wanted to detect this protein in the bioassay or like the microarray, micro fluidics. Uh, when you put the antibody, when you attach it using different uh, attachment places, you have a completely different behavior of your detection signal. And that was monitoring and monitor using uh, atomic force microscopy. So what you see in the, the colors are related. So depending on the shear, the shear flow, or in the case of the AFM was the pooling rate of the AFM uh, cantilever, cantilever, you had different uh, binding strengths. And it, we're curious about why does this happen? So can we, first of all, explain why attaching the antibody to different points influences the result? And that would determine or help us elaborate the model for the future. If you develop a new antibody to a new target, how can you predict where to attach it to, the, to your device or to like any other molecules that you want to attach to it? It will not interfere the binding recognition and there's an effort. So the AFM experiment, they connect the PDL1 to the substrate to the base, and then you bring Correct. down the antibody to yes. So in the in the their AFM, they connect the they have some molecules that we won't fold yeah. a known force to act as a fingerprint of the sure. signal. Uh, despite that, it's actually just a like a trick chemistry method to attach it the protein to the surface of your mica or whatever surface you have. And then on the antibody, you have multiple possible attachment places. Um, first of all, uh, since it was you developed one of you and you're running to say you don't know where it binds to the PDO1. Uh, the second is how to choose the attachment point. So they do it. What, what, what do you attach it to? AFM county lever comes down. Yeah, so the county lever has a, a a molecule that will react with a modified amino acid. So it's covalent, oh, okay. covalently bound I see. to the antibody. Yeah, so depending on the oh, there's a, a small spacer mm -hmm. here, not to interfere uh, entirely with it. So depending on the attachment point, it will produce a different result. So if you're running a sensor, you want your result to be predictable and repeatable. And do we know from experiments that you unfold the antibody or you detach it from PDL1 or you know, you know. know the force profile, you, you can you can see something happening. So you see that the force to so in this axis, the yeah. force and here are different. Let's follow one, one, one of the lines. lines. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the loading rate that is related to the speed you pull your yeah. system apart. And in here is the rupture for the yeah. yeah. One sense. thing that you see in many AFM ex experiments, the force mode, is that there is a large spread in the predicted force. What we want to understand is why the different attachment points have such different uh, forces. And the other one, and, and this you can see clearly if it's unfolding. So no matter the pulling rate, the rupture force will not increase. So what is normal to see is when you pull faster, the force will increase, especially if you have a catch one. So when you put more load, you will yeah. catch stronger. Yeah, so one of the, the questions is like, why blue and red, which are, the, which are the terminals, they will not grow in force that much? Unless if you pull super fast, it starts to behave a little. Yeah. It changes the, 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 
the mode of, of binding. And are these experiments? Experiments or simulation? This is an experiment. Yeah. How do you this know actually experiment. what is the rupture, the color that you have on your? I know the pulling point. You know that. I know that. Yeah. But they don't. They don't know. Except so the the attachment to the pulling points is oh yeah yeah I see it is. depends on the sequence. Gotcha. So when you select one pulling point that you that you yeah. have in mind, so you synthesize the AFI body with a modified amino acid, one that you can react with, with your AFM probe. I see. I see. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So we didn't know there is no uh, structure of, of the happy body. There is no structure of the complex. So oh. first thing we needed to do uh, for this job come together was well put them together. Yeah, that's classic. So the key idea one, since it's a famous protein, everyone's researching about it. It has few uh, crystals that we can use as reference, so it's mm -hmm. no trouble creating a model. The antibody is also a, a molecular class that is known for 20 years as a plenty of crystals of body and they all conserve the structure of matter. So even with like basic modeler, you can uh, get the result. Mm -hmm. So actually, that's what we did. Like, in one of the, the methods, we went one pipeline. Let's, let's get these models, like crystal or model using simple modeler, can be alcohol, and try to put them together. And also, since during the project, alcohol released in multiple mm -hmm. modes. Yeah. We also did the alcohol mm -hmm. and we end up with multiple models. So the interesting thing about this is that all of them, so we use ZDOF and Clustro. Clustro is the highest ranking protein protein dog in uh, software current. Mm -hmm. So it's been winning the competitions for at least the last two competitions mm -hmm. you won before alcohol and then alcohol came and won by far not even protein prediction but also protein protein interaction mm -hmm. prediction uh, which is uh, great so they all generated mostly these two uh, different orientations which which I call uh, perpendicular so uh, PDO one is here this is one of the crystals of PDO one the three VIP VIK so two major orientations. So perpendicular and this one I call parallel. So because there's a data sheet on the PDO one uh, side. All right. So so what is the blue, the dark blue three B I K? What is that? It is a crystal structure of PDL one. PDL one okay. is the uh, gray. Yeah. And three B I K. I have no idea which one it is. I don't remember this. Uh, three. Yeah, it's so it different from point. the helical structures that you talk later. But yeah, okay, so it has some. Yeah, there's no reference from uh, okay. similar molecules and complex mm -hmm. to that. Well, actually, to, to try, so how do we evaluate? We don't have a crystal to, to check. So let's use the information that is available. So what I did here is that we collected every single PDO1 uh, structure on the PDD. Alcohol did that already and what we so we were we didn't know which orientation of the major ones that appeared on alpha and plus pro and z dot which all kind of matched uh, each other which one was more reasonable so we went to the pdb we saw all the available structures and by investigating this final by investigating the modal uh, binding mode uh, it suggested that the, the orientation that I call perpendicular is the most sound or the most common that we find on the PDB. Now, now you have to. But you know, when you, you, I don't know which one is PDL1. Oh, yes. Yeah. So colors PDL1, are different. Uh, the, the, the colors are supposed to be green, is always PDL1. Okay, but I see. Since but the other since part it's then... primal, the, the one in the bottom, they are, all these structures are superimposed to this molecule in the bottom. Okay. So sometimes it's blue, sometimes it, it's green, but that's actually my fault. So because the, the chain in the PDB changed sure. A, B, A, D, and sure. so I've all decided to call it this. But most of the partners of your PDL1 here are beta sheets, right? Correct. And not yeah, alpha helical like your body is that you want to, right? Correct. 
So I have no rep, no actual reference to compare. So all we have here is some intuition. That actually, we have just yeah, we have a couple one of them, yeah. that binds in a similar sure. orientation. So we are getting gathering data to try to reach a decision in the end. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to do is, well, let's compare the models. So we decided at the time we did some uh, validation. We run the same uh, validation function from output, is which is the predicted LDDT among all every single model. We run modular dose for on all of them, and in the end, we decided that alpha code was giving us the best result. So what I'm showing here right now on the left is the evaluation of the two orientations. When we, when I say number one is the perpendicular, number two is the parallel. So based on the analysis that we have, the orientation number one, the perpendicular, got the highest scores overall. So in the Evaluation of the code. So this one is a PDA1 for all the residues, and on the bottom for the happy body. It's not a lot. So we still, mm -hmm. oh, what we do? For the record, the majority of the orientations that both uh, the, the three software gave us was, was the perpendicular. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's winning by far. But let's keep investigating. So what we, we decided to run a MD simulation for multiple copies to evaluate the stability of the complex. So we ran 100 uh, nanoseconds each copy with, with 16 replicas each. And we monitored some of uh, some qualities. But basically, what we monitored was the interface area between the two potentials. And also, we computed the MMGSA. So, since the, so the measure of infection energy. So almost binding between energy. Since it's the same molecule, the entropic component will not be like a big deal of this. So the relative uh, difference between these two should give us a good idea. So there was no uh, significant difference in the interface area. So it's still, I can't tell which one uh, we should use, but the binding affinity based on the GPSA, gave us a hint that maybe one of them is more stable than the other. So to help us decide what we did next, so we picked up this, the two molecules, we still have access to a molecular biology lab, and so we decided to, okay, so let's look at the surface. Let's try to disrupt the surface and see if we can, by disrupting the surface in the experiment, we can find some cures of where is the, how is the epitope? How is the interaction between them? So we looked at the surface and we selected, we handpicked some spots to perform some mutations. And if we think that's, the, the idea was, let's invert charges, let's put bulky groups in some of the areas and let's compare. And if uh, by creating this mutation, I will disturb the structure. Okay, so the first comparison we did was still computational. So we just repeat models using alpha code and measure the difference in, in the alpha code score to help us not only the visual analysis of the, those, the interfaces, but also use the alpha code score to help us decide which mutations to send to the web lab because, well, it's expensive to run this kind of stuff of guns. Okay, so using the wild type as reference, we picked up some of the uh, mutations that led to a to reduced alpha code score to send to lab. And I will, um, in addition, in addition, we also picked our favorite residue, the one I thought would disrupt the most. And we did a scanning of all possible mutations to see which mutation would interfere the most. Okay, so we were able to perform just a few of them. And this is the result that we get from the binding assay by flow cytometry. So proteins were expressed using the mutants, and then we can see how much of it was attached to PDA1 that was paid in service. And well, luckily, well, most of the mutations that we selected, if we compare these two tables, 
uh, were able to impact and give us hints of breaches of binding site. We have built. So, as highlighted, is a uh, glutamine to glutamate and isoleutine to alumine that impacted a lot based on the array. So, one that also impacted a lot was the tyrosine. But the tyrosine, we decided we, we didn't even have to run the simulation of the alpha fold because it had a, a hydrogen bond between the antibody and the protein of interest. I said, I mean, if you disrupt this, that would be enough. Mm -hmm. And actually, the experiment showed, showed us I mean, you kill entirely the interaction if you remove this, if you actually if you mutate the mm -hmm. amino acid. So to further confirm, and also that uh, more the, the epitope, we spend like a, a lot of money running the cross link mass spectrometry. So basically what you do is you put a probe and that, that binds to the to some certain spots of the protein. Uh, it is like 11 angstrom apart. So that's kind of the maximum distance you get between amino acids, then it digests you the protein and run through a mass spectrometer. Mm -hmm. And then from the fragments, you try to just like regular mass spec, yeah. you try to reconstruct what would be the sequence of the fragments. Mm -hmm. And based on um, the sequences that are connected, you can build up a map of the possible uh, epitopes. Mm -hmm. So this experiment, compared to other models, failed catastrophic, catastrophically for both orientation. So we still don't know how well the resolution of the, it's also by mode, how well the resolution of the mass spec is. Maybe the size of the probes like too big and we don't have enough resolution to measure the, the, the spots. So what I'm showing here is like the connections that came from the mass spec um, crossing the experiment. And actually, we measure the distance. So whatever is less than these those eleven or four angstroms distance, those are like reliable predictions. Mm -hmm. But still, it's very low resolution. Just out of curiosity, you guys actually did it yourself, or there is a facility or something? Uh, we hired a company in Switzerland, actually. Oh, I see. It because cost yeah, the fortune. Yeah, so there is this interaction uh, like Stephen Fried and Hopkins. Mm -hmm. Does it on his lab? Does it on protein? Protein, okay. right? And it seems like you know the result. I mean, this is obviously a very different task, right? You have a couple of proteins, right? Okay. Seems like the technique itself is very yeah. So that is something task. that has to be uh, refined. But right. I'm not sure if we're spending more on this because it was already super expensive. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So as I said, it failed catastrophically for the two binding modes. But we have a preference. So binding mode that is perpendicular had a higher number of matches. So, but we could not solve like precisely those are the, the interactions. So maybe because the complex is not, well, it's not a, a stone. It might be just fluctuating and sampling different orientations. And mm -hmm. during this process, processing occurs. Yeah. That is the, the hypothesis. No matter what, now the, the final decision. We also compared the alpha results with the GDAR and flip probe. And actually, alpha code for both different orientations gave us the best result, the best match. So, another point for alpha code. So, collecting this evidence, we had to come up with a decision so we can move on with our experiments with the, the MD simulations. So, we decided by now. Still, we get more data from the experiment, the, the wet lab experiments, but also the experiment. Mm -hmm. We all trust our instincts. So, we use the data, although it's not perfect, it gives us a good indication that one of the binding modes is the most probable. So, let's use it. So, for the next step, so to mimic what we do in the AFM, we want to run the simulation by connecting the, the protein to the AFM can't lever, takes apart and pull it apart and measure the force profile of it. So a quick uh, recap. So this protein, so it has some mechanical resilience. So it resists 
the force and gives a force profile. So what we do here, so in nature or in the biochip, your protein will be attached to a matrix, a surface that will be a shear flow from the microfluids or fluids, whatever, and it will go uh, in one direction and your protein will resist against it. So actually this mechanical resilience of mechanics is something that happens in many, many, many systems. And basically most of the proteins that we have, they have some kind of mechanical cues or mechanical resilience, mechanical properties that can be monitored. And this one was asked by Rafael to make propaganda of this publication. <laughs> okay. Okay, so how we do it in the simulation. So this is one example of the material adhesion. The situation is very similar. So we're gonna mimic a host protein that is fixed to a membrane. And then we have your, our like happy body will be this other molecule and something will happen to it. So in the, in the experiment, we attach a cantilever cantilever using a spacer and takes it to a surface and pull it apart. So, and then we do the simulation added to a, a, a spring on the top. And then we monitor the force profile. So similar to this, so we make some force, force goes up until there's a rupture and then the force goes nearly zero in the ideal scenario. Uh, if we repeat the simulation multiple times, as it's a dynamic, uh, process, you get a different different rupture force depending on how you pull it and the moment. So if you repeat this experiment multiple times, you get a distribution, and then you can predict what is the rupture force of the system. And let me just accelerate it to, to the video. So as an example for the bacterial adhesion, so to illustrate, we are fixing the protein in one spot, we're putting the protein in the other spot. And so it keeps resisting up to the point of rupture and not always the rupture is like clean. So it can have intermediate steps in the middle. So when your protein unfolds, you're gonna see lots of intermediate steps in your force profile. It's actually a, a big challenge to align all those those uh, peaks to derive a force profile. So in summary, we want to repeat the experience. We pick up our favorite protein. So we took the PDO one we put our prediction for the happy body, select the pulling points and the direction pull, and we expect to run like to create a nice force profile. Okay, that was supposed to come out here. <laughs> So do you know the PowerPoint now can do this? <laughs> how, do, how do you change the protein structure when you do this? Uh, it's it's just PowerPoint. Oh, it's just it's yeah, it's a 3D object. Oh, okay, I see, I see. It's an animation PowerPoint. Okay. It's a, a whole 3D object. I heard the same uh, confirmation of changes while you're uh, no, no. <laughs> I'm not coming yet. Okay, no. so easy. Let's just set up. No. So <laughs> uh, since you, you guys are the developers and for the method, yeah, it wasn't that easy. So we needed a lot of, and now we'll accelerate this. We needed a lot of tuning into the spring constant and mm. I mean, it took us months to realize which is the best spring, which is the best protocol to actually run your simulation. And actually it's something that I, I was discussing a little bit with Mariano about the cyber struggle. Let's first create a good protocol, mm -hmm. make sure what you're doing is sound, so you don't do like me, just waste a lot of time in the <laughs> supercomputer running multiple replicas. But this was like hundreds of replicas. Yeah, no, make mm -hmm. sure you're doing it right before you waste your time. So that's kind of the take home message. So instead of a mess of results, we have clear or clearer. Uh, so what was the mess. what was the trick here? The main. So change that you did to so get the, such a clean. The, the big change in here. So we have a spring that is oscillating, and this spring has a force constant, like the how. So in the experiment, how the cantilever, the cantilever bends. What's the strength of the yeah. head of a lever? So depending on the strength, you will get a different uh, 
signal, depending on what you're pulling. So if it's super strong while you're pulling, you need a, like, a strong cantilever or else it would just bend. So in the experiment, uh, in the AFM, you have to pick like the right cantilever to get a good signal to noise uh, ratio. And that was not the case for us. I was using a cantilever that was too strong. So everything was like shaking crazy. Mm -hmm. and then we tested multiple, yeah, tested, oh, not to, we tested multiple string constants, multiple speeds, and mm -hmm. even time set to see what would give us like a decent curve. And once we get like decent curve, we could apply signal processing uh, using this Zabinsky uh, Poly filter, which is the same that the AFM people use. Uh, your question. Um, did you um, try not using a uh, thermostat when doing these uh, mm -hmm. experiments? Because, you know, like the Langevin dynamics is imposing an external thing on right. your particles. So maybe noise. Yeah, that could be contributing to the deviation from the, the restraint form. Right. But how will you know, I keep temperature? Like yeah, not using per set. Well, I never, I mean, tried, I never tried that. Yeah, in MD, you can specify which particles to be subject to the stat. So maybe if you. So I think if yeah. I just put the term stat on water. Yeah, on just the water. Just the water and like the split. I don't know, but that's something that we can put in our validation set. So how to do the single force as possible. That's something to consider. Thanks. Uh, one thing that we do is we remove the barrel stuff. Mm -hmm. So we do the MVT when we do the, the pulling. Yes. So um, I haven't done this uh, pile simulation uh, in recent years, but I have the uh, uh, theory or speculation about these you know, hard spring uh, uh, high vibra uh, vibration, uh, high noise scenario. It's probably because the 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 well we define with the spring constant is very steep, and as this is moving, you, your molecule once bounce into a, say a thick wall, it immediately go to the other yeah. and uh, overshoot your your center of mass moving, mm -hmm. and then hit the other wall. And then that is not productive. You want you want the thing to move along this direction. Right. Supposedly you, you you shouldn't have the other wall to prevent it going back. If you probably just you know so so this is a limitation of the whole SMD code because you have a harmonic potential. I think uh, probably we can use a new Colmar code that just define one side potential and the other side you know nothing and. You, you bounce off this is a steep wall, you go somewhere and then you relax until uh, the, the wall catch up. That's something to consider. We can discuss later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But actually about the bouncing, but in some generations, you can actually see the molecule bouncing. Right, right. That, was, that was too much for the speed we were pulling. Okay, so since I'm very proud of this, and I improved this, before and after, so it was just mass, and we could like, get a good profile. So I will accelerate not to waste a lot of time. Let's show some force profiles. Also, this is interesting. So forget about the left, just to the right. So what I'm showing on the right is black, the force profile for how much it is resisting. And uh, in red is the contact area between the two proteins. And what we're looking for, we, we wish that we always can get like the force profile. So the force is going up and then you snap. So you, you can clearly see from the contact area, it goes together with the force. If that's not the case, which is when you pull from the terminal, your force is like shaking. That, that means if you visualize, it is unfolding slowly. Mm -hmm. So only from this graph, you can already see that when you pull from the terminals, which is R1 and R5, you have a closing. So that might explain, or actually might tell the experience, do not fix the, the, the body from these terminals. So which 
other point should I choose? We'll decide later because R2 and R5 and R2 looks they look uh, quite okay. So accelerate into the analysis of simulation. So some interpretation, graph interpretation. So from the extreme case when we see it's unfolding. So the picture you're seeing is a, an average from the one two nanoseconds prior to the rupture in multiple rep, uh, replicas. I just took random samples from that moment. So where the curve is very steep. So the terminals are unfolding slowly. This one is unfolding and like, let's say, wrapping out while the other ones are much more stable. <clears throat> oh, nice animation. It's just another view uh, to showcase the PowerPoint show. The texture is rotating because it's cool. Mm -hmm. You can actually rotate inside PowerPoint oh. as well. But so not... do you introduce a 3D object you said, or how do you do that? So you generate the object using PMD. Like the as the X map or not? No, it's a no, no, no. object OBG. map. OBG. It's an object. 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 OBG. OBG. You can also create the SPL, but SPL does not have colors. So OBJ is the best. So what I do is I create the object with the colors. So OBJ and MTX with the color matrix, put on Blender and save as FEX. Okay. Yeah, that works uh, quite well. Yeah, but I guess we are trying to animate them too, also trajectories rather than just and FBX has trajectories. Yeah, so you can put trajectories. Oh, okay. That is the, the format for object animation. Cool. So let's see. This it's your job. Yeah, <laughs> your job. That is your job. Yes, exactly. I'm at the last step. Where <laughs> next week? Come back next week. Yeah, right? I have a question for you, on Blender. <laughs> yes, because then I can get any scene from VMD. And put it into a PowerPoint, and it's able to rotate um, from object to a file box. And it's all put the object in here, yeah. like straight here, but you won't have colors. Yeah. So, so PowerPoint can does not read the so, color map. Oh. So yeah. What we what I do is put on Blender and save as a single format, so it brings the colors. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be like a string of multiple objects, and then it would be an animated an animation. Right. Yes. Yeah. I never tried it. Oh, actually, I did try it. So PowerPoint has some has a dinosaur, so you can yeah. just put the dinosaur. Yeah. Yes, it's cool. So it works. It works. Okay, I won't bother that much with you. So we kept analyzing and trying to compare the the average. Oh, that is average. So I don't want to talk about this. So we went. Yeah, because it's like sixty minutes already. So we went to the details to see. So try to find the reasons and actually which are the residues that are making the separation of the complex seem differently. So what we did, and this is just to show up, uh, for look at location reasons and color codes is I mean it's consistent everywhere. So I marked a few residues. So the first one. That we identified. So, we're also using this to validate the actual mapping. So, one of the residues that he pointed is the tyrosine 106 that I mentioned. If you remove it, it will just kill the interaction. So, in the moments prior to the rupture, not the whole simulation, just prior to the rupture, so the strongest interactions are color coded here. So, the darker, uh, the stronger the interaction, the area of contact, so to be more clear. So clearly, uh, residues identified are matching. So not that much, but interesting that the, the residues with a higher color, uh, like in the PBL one, are matching mostly what we got there. So we didn't get all the mutations. So I have no idea what would be the impact of coloring one or and we couldn't do mutations of the everybody yet. But that's something that we can check. One thing that I know is that the residues, I, I forgot to mark, the residues with the higher area, of course, were the engineered ones because they're infecting. But that's uh, quite obvious. And we also were able to see the pair interaction. So, which residue in the receptor of PDA1 was interacting with the residue in the happy body at that moment prior to rupture? And it's interesting that from the terminals, 
they, they have totally different behavior. So we are trying to build up a story to explain this, but at least we know that the tyrosine, the repeated period, the it has a high impact on this uh, stop with it. So to wrap up this story, we also did a network analysis and this moments prior to the rupture. So the, the extra information that we wanted to know is what is the, the, the pathway uh, where the force propagates? So how does it propagate in the different areas? So we we're able to draw this with the cool PowerPoint also. And basically I will summarize on the next uh, slides. So most of them, the basically they share the same connection pathway, no matter which is the pulling point. So it goes somewhere inside the antibody, but most of the times they connect through the same region. Yeah, actually the most important are the, the ones in the middle. Uh, what we found interesting is that some of the major and secondary force pathways, so terminals and, and two have basically one, this one has two. So maybe the one that has two can be like the sweet spot. So we're maybe drawing uh, which are the pathways. So R4 is the one that starts like basically in the middle. Maybe this is the best way because it has a more reliable um, force propagation step. Okay, to, to wrap up. So we got the experimental simulations. And based on the opinion of our collaborators, we're follow, following uh, a nice trend and that is similar to them. Uh, we will be seeing a cross of uh, the green and yellow. So we have this in, in the future because the speeds are entirely different. We didn't put them right in the same units, but here is. So experimental data is here, and we are order of magnitude faster. Mm -hmm. than the, so what what we put here is what about this gap? So this pulling speed gap. So experiments pull like ultra fast, we pull oh sorry, ultra slow, we pull ultra fast compared to them. Where is this gap? So since I'm talking about it, so we recently uh, published a paper on, on Jets, and also there's a paper on, on bioarchive you can consult on adhesions where we closed this gap by using force grain simulations. So this is a classic model. This is a science from GFL. And this is the in vitro experiments. So by adding the force grain simulations using the Go Martini model, we were able to find almost uh, complete this gap in terms of speed between the microdynamic simulation. Well, how I think possible. So we tried to do it for this system in the, in the same manner, and the profiles we got were quite reasonable. So we're still working on this. I mean, I have some more slides later. If anyone is interested in seeing the whole process, this is not entirely straightforward. We have to correct because the cosmic models like big blobs of all atoms. There are some things you have to do, but we can discuss this later. And as I said, this is a work in progress. So to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge all the group in Auburn. So Rafael, Priscilla, Haissa, Maria, all the guys, and also our collaborators specifically for this work, like Michael Nash and Johnson in the Switzerland, and also our sponsors as usual. And I will end up here. And if you saw my file, you can check the Ask about the other papers and other words. Okay. Okay, thank you, Diego. So, time for questions. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, when you try to predict the complex structure, um, you said the the outcome is probably the orientation is right, but the detail interface might be uh might not be uh exact so that the you 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 have these uh 
relative distance have different places that generally match, but it's not really. You, you're talking about the 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 um the mass spec, right? I think this is the figure, right? Right. So, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it looks like the the molecule is matching that, but the interface is probably not optimal. That is correct. Yeah. So yeah. we are measuring this after the best measurements are not from the original model; mm -hmm. they are from the refined model. So we ran, as I mentioned, sixteen replicas, uh, one hundred nanoseconds each, mm -hmm. and the structure that you see here, a refined model. <laughs> Uh, is the most uh, prevalent cluster. So yeah. cluster number one is a representative structure of cluster number one. So I, 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 I noticed in your later um, uh, point simulation uh, mm -hmm. figures, it looks like the interface allow uh, I hold the rest of you. Uh, Correct. Is it the three helix are bundled together also through I hold the packings? That can be. That can be. But, but I think that so the circuit that we use to start the the polling is, as I mentioned, the, the most representative from, from the cluster. Mm -hmm. So I assume that after this much simulation, so 1.6 microsecond, 16 times 100, I don't know how to do calculations. I use my phone. Yeah. One, <laughs> so yeah, it's still a, so the, 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 I, I hope that the, the, the packing was, mm -hmm. Sample, I wouldn't say correct. Better so sample. I, I, I would try model. to make a prediction out of the uh, individual single helix out of this, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, body to see if there will be a, a preferred uh, interface for individual helix. Because if the, the hyperbole uh, uh, interaction within the, the three helix bundle is competing with the binding, mm -hmm. you might, you know, through the binding, uh, changes the, mm -hmm. the folding of the three helix bundle. But you mean to, to, to predict, to verify using a, an experiment, just run the single helix? Or you right, so for example, run you... the alpha fold only with the helix. But if you, if you do it, you, you miss, you lose the scaffold of the whole. Right. right, that is the point. The, the point is uh, the this scaffold of three headed bundle may not be sustained once you bind to your uh, your your protein target because the, you, you have competing and all the interactions. I'm not sure. So during all the simulation that we did, we did not notice a significant change in confirmation. Mm -hmm. So 1.6 microseconds times two orientations and we didn't see it like opening and competing. I think it's pretty sturdy. Oh yeah. yeah. It's also optimized. So the antibody is also optimized by thermal stability. So that's why it's super useful. You can yeah you can leave it on the shelf for like many days. I, mm -hmm. I had actually a related question. So um, we are usually very careful in terms of what the structure we start with. And now, I mean, how confident you are in the initial structure that you're using for all the simulations? You know, what if it's like this and not like that? Yeah, it could be. So right. none of the methods, yeah, none of the methods predicted the, the, the whole opposite. So you are right. relying on the prediction. I am, I am relying on the prediction. So we, we actually, so we took the, the data that we have. So the mutation experiments and also the plot link. Yeah. And actually what we did, so we, we measured some distances on time off again mm -hmm. and rotated to see the best match. And actually the best ma match between mm -hmm. the experiment and the prediction was the alpha fold structure. Mm -hmm. I was hoping it was first pro must have discredited them, but yeah. I couldn't. They so we, yeah, so I, I I wanted to also ask about your system, you think. So we have a weird system and I don't trust the structure at all. There's a complex structure between two proteins. One of them is a membrane protein and the other one has multiple helices. And this helices, when you look at the final model generated by alpha pod apparently, one of the helices is so far apart from the, the other protein, no connection, no covalent linkage. It's just especially so far apart 
that when we put it in a membrane, lipids go between them. So have you noticed anything like this from us for this? I never, so it's entirely separated? Yeah, yeah. completely is it separated. separated. Yes. Like this is a protein and then the helix is the so far It is apart. connected. Yeah, it's connect two proteins. Oh, two proteins. Two proteins. Okay. So, but there is no connection between this helix and the other protein. So I can alpha fold. Alpha fold could have modeled it maybe here, even you know, no interaction, no. And there is no membrane when you do the. In the alpha fold, no. But when you put it in a lipid bilayer, lipids go in between because there is open there is, space. Uh, there is space. Them. Yeah. Yeah. So the packing of alpha fold is not. Not the good. best of the world, yeah. Yeah, and it is not. You don't have enough membrane proteins in the database I see. for you to use as a reference. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you need to refine this in the yeah. order and actually maybe apply some system constraints. I see. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I didn't mention on Cluspro is that in order to actually bind to the binding site I wanted, I needed to add distance restraint. I see. So I said, okay, so. Keep these two proteins together in this side. Yeah. Because I knew from the PDB and the like 60 structures, because mm -hmm. that was the most probable binding site. I see. I didn't have to, I didn't put many restraints, three restraints, and they were very flexible. So it wouldn't bind to the, mm -hmm. the opposite side. I see. I see. Yeah, I guess we have to try other methods you can in kind in addition to alpha four to get something meaningful actually. Yeah. And you can have, yeah, you can apply some distant restraints before putting in the membrane. Yeah, they don't have anything from experiment, actually. Yeah. Nothing. They just know that they are together. That's it. No constraint that we can use. No more living. Cool. Point. I have a, like a methodology question. Uh, so during these polling experiments, um, the extension uh, from some of your plots, I saw go to like 10 nanometers or 100 angstrom. And this is like pretty long distance, I would say. Uh, at least with if you. So yeah, my question is about the water. How you treat the water box? You initially start with a smaller box, and as you extend, maybe resulting, or do you start with the full hundred? We start from a water. huge water box. Okay. Yeah, you have to run some trials. So especially for this for the terminals that I'm full, it it is awful if you get to get to. You never know. know. Extremes, no? You never know if the protein is going to unfold. Because mm. I, I remember so, on my own, yeah. the number of lots and there was much greater than ten. Yeah. So when when there's a snap, so you won't unfold, which is three yeah. of the cases. You can you can do a small box and yeah. you're safe. But this guy, is, I had to repeat so many times because mm -hmm. eventually. So because when you run the tests, you run at high speed, so you want to run the benchmark. Yeah. But some system when you pull too fast, they behave. It's not catch ball, but they they will not unfold. They will just just go. I see. It, it will it will snap before this unfolds because you. It's the system just pulling too fast, and then mm -hmm. I go to the slow speed that takes like a hundred times more time, and then you realize ah oh, no it's unfolding and I have to repeat like ten yeah. days of simulation again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is awful. So we have a similar system, early simulating. So we have to start with a very large water box. So you can have the completely unfolded system in it at the end. And the good thing, at least, is you won't occupy a huge volume. If you find <clears throat> you, you pull it, you won't go around. It's not your max solution. You don't use it. You have to use it to hate it. Hmm. Because sometimes, so one example, I'll give you later if you're interested. So sometimes it goes around the periodic boundary conditions and then just keep going and you keep pulling and it keeps going. And it's awful. I see. Yeah. Luckily, MD, MD doesn't do that. And it's your friend. <laughs> that is one reason to. You said leave. one good thing about an angle. I, I love it now. I, I hate romance for this periodic boundary conditions. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Okay, I don't see any. Let's thank you everyone one more time. Okay.